Be safe. Standing in for Brother Darrell while they're on vacation. Do you not? Amen? Amen. Thank you, Brother Bill. It's good to see you in the service. There are some that are out because of quarantine situations, and we pray that uh, uh, they, those situations should be lifted before long, and we're thankful for that. Y'all get my hear an echo. Y'all hear me? Can you fix that, Cody? It's always an, always an experiment trying to get everything right. It's still there. Please pray for the Bible school that when we hit that button tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, we want, to, we want it to be ready. And Brother Cody has, been, has worked extremely hard at this. I've worked extremely hard at this in order to make this ready. And so we're, we're thankful for the opportunity. And we, we pray that everything will be, will be uh, will go off technolo with technology the way it's supposed to. Tomorrow, the uh, senior kids ages 13 and above, we've got a group going to, to uh, teen camp, next camp. They'll be leaving at 10.30 in the morning, and I'll be driving uh, some of them over there, but I'm not staying, but Cody's going to take care of them. We're thankful for Sister Sydney. Uh, she's going to sponsor the girls, and uh, we're, we're grateful for that. And so, in fact, I'm going to, uh, since I'm not going to be there, I'm going to actually um, view camp through their eyes through Sydney's eyes and Cody's eyes when they come back and they tell me what, about the experience. So, so uh, you know, that's, uh, that's important to me. But uh, you pray for our teens at camp. I think we got six or seven going, and uh, uh, we want it to be a good experience. This is more of a mature camp, not like the one that, with, that includes the younger children. So, and that's why we go with both camps. We want our older teens to have this kind of experience and as such. And um, the missionary is from Australia. I don't remember his name right now, but um, uh, he was at the camp last week as well. And I understand from someone who participated in the camp that it was a wonderful camp. So we're expecting that, that to uh, reoccur this next week for our kids as well. Last Sunday, I ask you to consider the message of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. As Jesus said to his disciples, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me about righteousness because I'm going to the father. And when you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. And the point was that Jesus said to his disciples, I will send the Holy Spirit, I will send him to you. So the message of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this world is not given to the world. It is channeled through you, even today, through us as believers in Jesus Christ, and especially through us as a congregation, as membership of First Mabelvale. Our witness as First Mabelvale, as well as, me, as an individual believer, our witness points the lost to Jesus, convincing them of sin and their need to believe in Jesus for redemption. And the Holy Spirit convinces the world of sin through your witness and my witness as believers. It also convinces the world of righteousness because the world sees in us or should see in us a different way of living, a righteous way of living, a godly way of living. And by us showing the world the footsteps of Jesus, living the way that Jesus would live, this too would convince them of righteousness and the world of judgment. Listen to our world. The troubles in our world, fires in California, floods in Germany, a war in Afghanistan that's not going well, political turmoil in, in, in Washington, gun violence in our city streets, trouble, trouble, 
but we know as, as, as believers that our God is in control, do we not? We know as believers that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we've read the final chapter in the book. And we know and have this faith because Satan, the prince of this world, stands judged. When Christ came up from the grave, he condemned Satan to his eternal fate. So I want to build on this. The fact that we, ye shall be witnesses unto me after you receive power from on high, as Jesus said. I want to build on this today by going to John chapter 14 and verse 12 through 14. Turn in your Bibles there with me. John 14 and verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. These words of Jesus, perplexing as they may be on one level, are powerfully inspiring and encouraging when you ponder them. And in their context, I'm, they're meant to be powerful for us today. And before we go any further in this message, I'm going to do something I forgot. Brother Jeremy Becker, come do our Facebook share. Say what? Is that what it was? Well, maybe, maybe because of his prayer, God reminded me this one's going dead. You got one? Get another one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right. Those who are dependent on the Spirit of Jesus leave behind a legacy of peace. And I'm going to read John chapter 14 and 27. Peace I leave you with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and be not afraid. Um a legacy is something that we leave behind. Uh, you've got a, a physical le legacy, um, your money, uh, material items, and uh, we've also got a, a, a legacy that isn't physical. Um, it's it's uh, an impression that we left uh, on people's lives with our actions. And um, I had a little I had a little thing written out, and then yesterday happened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a, a little bit of a personal te personal testimony of how. Jesus' peace can change somebody's life. And uh, while I'm telling this, uh, please don't get it twisted. This is all uh, for the glory of God. This is not uh, anything that I have done. This is uh, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit that has worked in my life. Um, in 2017, I had just gotten out of prison. Uh, I did a year on a parole violation. And I had gotten myself a, a 95 Chevy Silverado. Uh, if anybody uh, knows uh, those old pickup trucks, they could be a handful. And um, I had uh, some, some busy stuff to do on a Friday afternoon, and I, my dash wasn't working. I didn't have a license, and I had been reading my speed with my tachometer, and uh, that all went out. So I decided I was going to replace my dash and my truck. And I figured it was take a few bolts out, unhook a couple things, and then uh, slap the new one in. Well, about five hours later, I had missed all my appointments. Um, I had gotten my dash uh, somewhat taken apart, but enough to where I couldn't get it put back in proper. So now my truck isn't running, and I'm getting frustrated, and I went to kitchen, and my foot went through the windshield. Well, uh, I, I, something in me snapped, and I grabbed a sledgehammer, and I uh, went to beating the windshield, the rest of my windshield out of my truck. I beat the dash out of my truck, and then I uh, put holes all down the driver's side of my truck. Um, needless to say, my truck was down for about 12 days, and it cost me about $800 to get it uh, fixed proper. Well, 
That was, uh, that was back when I was using. That was back when I was living in the world. That was back when uh, anger, frustration, uh, immaturity, um, insecurities, um, they, they, they ruled my life. And um, so we're going to move past that to yesterday. Um, we've got an elderly neighbor, uh, Mr. Brantley, that uh, had his kitchen sink go out, and he didn't, uh, he didn't know if he could afford to have a plumber do it, so I offered to take care of it for him. And uh, I've never done any plumbing before. I'm a tree man. I don't know anything about anything other than tree work, and, uh, but I figured I'd give it a shot. It couldn't be that hard. Uh, they gave me the wrong fittings at, uh, at Home Depot. Um, I got a, a pipe cutter from Brother Roy that ended up breaking on me when I first tried to use it. Went and got a new pipe cutter uh, and then ended up cutting my pipe too short to where the proper fittings wouldn't fit on there. Uh, while all this is going on, Mr. Brantley's 92 years old and his blood pressure's bad. He's about to stroke out. He's talking about calling emergency plumbing outfitters and uh, cutting, had never been able to use his sink again. How's he going to do his dishes? And... Uh, we, we stuck with it. It took about four or five hours, but we, uh, we laughed the whole time. Um, I, I, we ended up getting the sink uh, properly installed. Everything is running good. And um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, accomplish things in a positive manner, be able to serve other people in a positive manner to where my, uh, my impression on their life is, uh, is positive Whereas uh, uh, before, people were a little bit wary of me coming over because of what I might do. Um, there was, uh, you know, some talking behind the back. It was uh, the the the, uh, the difference. The difference is immense, and it's all because of uh, the peace that Jesus has given me, uh, the peace that has Jesus has given us, and um, and I uh, I want to I want to encourage everybody this week when you come up on your trials and tribulations to follow. The, uh, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there was a lot of praying yesterday. I promise you that. Um, there was a lot of praying, but it, it went smooth. Uh, the Lord answered my prayers, and, uh, and I pray that he does for you this week. And, um, and, uh, and I love all you guys, and have a great week. Thank you, Brother Jeremy. I won't start all over. We'll pick up right where I left off, okay? You know, the Holy Spirit leads us to be the kind of people that Christ wants us to be. And Jeremy has, because of his past life is gone because he's got a new life in Christ. And the Holy Spirit is within his heart and within Rachel's heart and within our hearts to lead us to be the kind of people that Christ wants us to be. And that's exactly what this message is about. These words of Jesus, truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Jesus is telling us that he has a, that he has a design, that he has something already in mind as far as what he wants our lives to be like as believers and as Christians. And these words may be perplexing on one level, but they're inspiring and encouraging when you think about them in their context. I think that these words are powerful for our life today and for the life of our church today and tomorrow. They're words for your life. They bear directly on your life as well as our life together as First Mabelville and in these exciting days. What they say is that all of us who believe in Jesus will carry on with his ministry and in some wonderful way we will do something greater than the works of Jesus. Imagine that. And to that end, we have access in prayer to Jesus so that everything that we need, everything we need to accomplish the kingdom work of God, we ask for and we will receive. We will do the works that Jesus did, and he will equip us for success in all our ministries at First Mabelville. Amen? So let's break this down into three parts. 
Number one, we will continue his work. Number two, in some wonderful way, we will all do something greater than the works of Jesus. And number three, to that end, we will, we will have access in prayer to Jesus every day for everything that we need. We can ask and we will receive. John 14, 12 said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Two crucial observations. First, his promise is not made to the apostles alone, but to all who believe. And second, this is a promise that we will do the works of Jesus. It is not yet a promise, though it will be soon. It is not yet a promise that we will do greater works, just the works of Jesus. And it is a promise to all believers. There's no exclusion here if you're a Christian. You should not think that this is for pastors or Veteran Christians or highly spiritual, mature Christians or professional Christians or missionaries or deacons or evangelists. No, the text says, whoever believes in me, believers, pure and simple, will do the works I do. And we have seen this exact phrase before, have we not? Whoever believes in me. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst, Jesus said. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. In other words, this is normal Christianity. This is what it means to be a Christian. Believing on Jesus is what unites you to him for eternal life. And when it says, whoever believes in Jesus will do this or that, it is describing the normal Christian life. This promise in verse 12 is not made to the apostles alone, but to all who believe. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, we create problems for ourselves immediately by thinking of those amazing miracles. At this point in the Gospel of John, Jesus has turned water into wine. He has read the mind of the woman at Samaria. He has healed the official son. He's healed the man crippled for 38 years. He's fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He's walked on water. He's healed a man born blind, and he's raised Lazarus from the dead, even though Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. So what did Jesus mean when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Did Jesus mean that every Christian should do these things or or every believer should do one or two of these things, and if you do not, then there's something wrong with you? Not likely. As a matter of fact, in the history of the New Testament, where miracles are mentioned, they are a gift that some Christians have and other Christians do not have. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, to each is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the Faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the workings of miracles. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. Well, if Jesus did not mean that believers would do miracles like him, then what did he mean? When he said, whosoever believes in me will do the works that I shall do, that I do. The answer is found by connecting in your text in John chapter 14, verse 11 to verse 12. So look at verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. So the word believe and works occur together in verse 11, just like they come together in verse 12. The works of Jesus, all his miracles and his teachings were designed to have a purpose. And that purpose was to lead people to believe in him. 
He is saying, look at my life. Let the things I do join with my words and lead you to faith. That's what verse 11 says. So verse 12 follows, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. But so putting verse 11 and 12 together and let the function of works be the same in both verses, Jesus is saying in verse 11, my works function to lead people to faith in me. And then when you get to verse 12, when you believe in me, I will work in you like a vine works with a branch and your works like mine will lead people to faith. So the connection between verse 11 and 12 goes like this. Believe me, Jesus said, on account of my works. Let my works lead you to faith. And because whoever believes in me will also do the works that lead others to believe in me as well. These are works that point to Jesus. So what are the specific works that Jesus has in mind? What defines him here is that they are pointers to Jesus, which help other people believe in him. They are a witness that leads people to faith. And this is the intent of his works. This was the intent of his life. And he is saying that this should be the intent of our life as well. That whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. Works that point other people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus. As believers in Jesus. That's what our life should be about. Living in a such a way that people see Jesus in us. And through our witness, through the way that we live, we're pointing people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. The works that point people to faith. This is what this text is about. So if we search this exact phrase that's in verse 12, the works that I do, it occurs in another place in the Gospel of John, namely John chapter 10 and verse 25. There Jesus answered them and said, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Remember, Nicodemus could not deny that. Jesus, I know you're a teacher come from God because of the, of the things that you do. So again, the function of the works in John chapter 10 is the same as in John chapter 14 in our text. My works are the things that I do that bear witness of me. And Jesus means that every one of us who are believers, every one of us here, who've been born again. Every one of us who are members of First Missionary Baptist at Mabel Vale, we're marked by this. We, we are united to Jesus in order to carry his work by his power, doing the kinds of things that bear witness to him, that point people to Jesus and, and through Jesus to the Heavenly Father. And is not this the Lord's Prayer? Not the Lord's Prayer that he gave as a model prayer, but the Lord's Prayer when he knelt in the garden and prayed to his heavenly Father, Father, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Would it not be wonderful in our lives if we could say with the Apostle Paul, I've lived my life. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. God, I've done what you've asked me to. And what he's asked us to do is by the way that we live and by how we witness and what we say, he's asked us to point others to Jesus. How do we do that? Well, one way is real simple. He was very plain in John chapter 13. He said, by this shall men know that you're my disciples, by the love you have 
one for another. I am so thankful. You don't know how thankful I am that First Mabelville is a loving church. A life of love will draw attention to the truth of Christ and the reality of our own life in Him. And therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We're defined by the, what we do in our life. We're defined by the works of our life. And that should flow from our faith in Jesus and point to the glory of Jesus, leading others to trust in Christ for their salvation. Every Christian can do these works. This is living a life. Living the life that Christ has designed for us. This is the aroma of Christ. We are the light of the world. We were dead, but now we are alive. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Those works that Jesus did. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God hath prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has designed that when we were saved that we would live holy and blameless before others showing them to Christ. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I will do. The second part of this text, John 14, 12, is that in some wonderful way, we will all do something greater than the works of Jesus. Now, he said that. I didn't. And I think he meant what he said. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. And again, folks, this is every believer. This is not the apostles, not just the pastors, the deacons, the evangelists, or teachers. Whoever believes in me, greater works than these will he do. This is the normal mark of being a Christian, not being an apostle. So if you think greater works means more, more miraculous, it's going to be kind of difficult for you to walk on water. Feed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Raise the dead. I don't, know, I don't know of any Christian who has ever lived inside or outside the New Testament who's ever done all of these things, let alone something more miraculous than Jesus. And again, we do not expect this because the New Testament tells us do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues? And Paul's answer was no. Which means that when Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father, he probably did not mean these kinds of miraculous, spectacular works. No apostle, no missionary, no Christian anytime, anywhere has outperformed Jesus in doing those kinds of things. So we need clarity. What does he mean? There are two clues. The first is the phrase at the end of verse 12, because I'm going to the Father. Greater works than these will every believer do because I'm going to the Father. And the other clue is in the text in John chapter 20. Flip over there just a few pages. John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus said to his disciples after he was raised from the dead, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So in John 14, 12, Jesus is saying that his disciples will not only continue his works, but they will do greater works because he goes to the Father. And on the way to the Father... Jesus goes to the cross 
and lays down his life for his sheep. I give my life for my sheep, he said. Fulfilling the words of John the Baptist when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is crucified, risen from the dead, ascends to God in heaven where he sends the Holy Spirit so his, so his disciples can accomplish the things that he has asked them to do. So in John 20, 21, he's saying that his disciples are to continue his work by receiving the Holy Spirit. And in that power, impart the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus based on the death of Jesus and his resurrection. How important is it for people to see Jesus in you? It may be so important that if they don't see Jesus in you, they will die in their sins without Christ. You see what the Lord's talking about? He's called us to do the works that he has done. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. The spirit in you will be the spirit of the crucified and risen Christ. The message you preach will be the message of not of one promise one day, but the one who has already come and died for your sins. It is a message of a paid ransom, a message of a complete payment, a message of a finished propitiation. It is finished, Jesus said on the cross of Calvary. Redemption is complete. And so the difference between Abraham, Isaac, David, Anybody in the Old Testament, the difference between the apostles and disciples that followed Jesus before his resurrection, the difference between us and Jesus himself is that when he preached the gospel, he was talking about something that was yet to happen because he hadn't died on that cross yet. He hadn't rose again from the dead yet. But now through the Holy Spirit living within us, we have a message that that has already happened. It is a historical fact that Jesus is, was crucified at Calvary for our sins, buried for three days, and he rose again for our salvation. That's a historical fact that we can look back and tell people it is done. It is finished. Believe in Jesus. And in that sense, the things that we do for Christ are far greater, Jesus said, than what he has done for himself. Because we can look back to the historical fact and tell people that if you believe in Jesus, he's already died for your sins. If you believe in Jesus, he's already been raised again for your salvation. If you believe in Jesus... These things have already happened. You can lay your life on them. It can become the foundation of your life and you will be born again. It is finished. Therefore, we convince the world of sin so that they would believe in Jesus. We convince the world of righteousness by living a godly life before them. We convince the world of judgment because we have this blessed hope that goes beyond the troubles of this world. And that leads us to the third part of our text. The first part was all who believe in Jesus will carry on his work. The second part is we will all do something greater than the works of Jesus. And now the third part. Everything we need to accomplish this, we can ask and receive. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You will have everything that you need to do the works that Jesus does, even those greater works. We seek to let our light shine in this world. We seek to love one another in Christ and show people that there's been a change in our life 
and that we have forgiveness of sins in the name of the crucified and risen Christ. And we, 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 we show people this by sharing the gospel with them. And the Lord is saying here that this is what I'm asking you to do. This is what I'm asking you to do. So therefore, whatever you need to accomplish this, I'll give it to you. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And you notice in this text in John chapter 14 that there is no condition other than in my name. In John chapter 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. That's a condition, but it's not here. No condition is in John, 1 John chapter 5. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we will have the request that we've been asked of him. No condition. Only one condition in my name. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will give you the power of the crucified and risen Christ. And now I promise you that you can ask for anything in my name to accomplish sharing my gospel with other people, going into all the world, making disciples of all peoples, whatever you need to accomplish that. No other conditions. Just do it in my name, and I will give you everything that you need. That's why I believe. That if we're doing the work we should be doing for the Lord at First Mabelville, there is nothing that can stand in our way. Nothing. And if you've noticed this ministry in the last couple years, we're emphasizing building our young youth up. Have a strong youth program with young mothers and fathers who want to be involved with their children in church. And we have five families in this virtual Bible school uh, that starts tomorrow in which mother and daddy aren't coming to church. <laughs> but they've agreed this week to sit down with their kids and do a Bible lesson with them. You know how I'm praying? I'm praying the seed of the gospel will convict their hearts and we have mom and daddy and the kids all in church. Any way we can. Whatever we need, he says, I'll give it to you because I want you to tell others about me. I want you to share me with those that you work with, those that you live with, that are your neighbors, those that are your family. I want you to share me. I want them to see your witness, hear your witness, see your life changed because you walk in righteousness. Do the work that I've called you to do. But we've got to do it in his name because it is in his name that gives him the glory and not us. Every prayer, whatever you need, I'll give you. When Jesus came to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all peoples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do the things I have commanded you. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, you need to be a disciple through the new birth. You must be born again. And you need to follow the Lord in baptism because that's what he's asked you to do. And to show people by example that, you're, that you've been changed, that you're dead to sin, but now you're alive in Christ. And you need to be taught the things that Christ has commanded to, that we should teach because you as a believer are asked of Jesus, not ask of me, not ask of anybody else, but you are asked of Jesus simply because you're a believer to continue the work of Christ by leading others and showing others and pointing others to Jesus. 
This is accomplished by the power and authority of Christ. All power is given to me. All authority is given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all peoples. This is accomplished by the presence of Christ in our life. His Spirit lives within us. And because His Spirit lives within us, He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So Christ in you, and Christ in me, and Christ working together with First Mabelville, it empowers us, and it enthuses us, and it guarantees us that what we need in order to reach people with the gospel of Christ, He said, I will give it to you. Brother Bill, come and let's do an invitation. We're going to sing just 